What this is about is it's about trying to create participative democracy, not representative. It's not saying elect 17 people and then they now know everything and will make all the decisions for you. It's saying elect 17 people and then their job is to build a community where whatever it is you want to do, you can get done and there will be money and support. And the instinctive answer should be yes. For episode 25, my guest is Peter McFadgen. As well as serving as an independent councillor and mayor of Froome in Somerset, Peter has worked in the areas of social justice for 40 years. He founded Sustainable Froome and is a director of Froome's new renewable energy co-op. He is the author of Flat Pack Democracy, a DIY guide to creating independent politics. As ever, we are always looking for ways to take our connection deeper from the broadcaster-listener relationship into more of a community. We have an all-day event coming up in London on September the 2nd in a beautiful venue. There is more information on our website and I hope that those of you in the area can join us. There are still a couple of spaces left for my presence mentoring programme starting on August the 15th. And if you want to support us in making this show, please head to our community page and become a monthly supporter. It really does make a difference for us. And now for an inspiring dive into flat pack democracy. I hope that you enjoy this conversation. Welcome to The Future is Beautiful with me, your host, Amisha Gadiali. On this show, we explore the weave between politics, spirituality, creativity and sustainability. Every one of us has ideas and personal experiences to share that can lead us to a brighter future. Despite the challenges we face as a global community or the pressures that we meet in our daily lives, when we stop and dare to dream, to ask ourselves the big questions and to share what we are already doing, we create the future that we wish to wake up for. That future is beautiful. I'm delighted today to be joined by Peter McFadden. Thank you for welcoming me into the shed at the end of your garden here in Froome. Pleasure. I would love to start by asking you, like, was there a moment when you decided to get more involved in, in local politics and in what was happening in your area, or did it kind of happen sort of accidentally? Um, so both, <laughs> uh, both a moment and accidentally. Um, although it depends what you mean by politics. I mean, I guess yeah. what you mean is, 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 is my involvement with local politics and having been elected um, yeah. in that. Because I've been involved in, in politics with a small p ever since we came here 30 years ago. Yeah, I suppose the thing that I find really interesting is having also, I mean, myself been involved in in the big p mm. westminster politics um but also co continually in the, in the small p politics i find that a lot of good people that really want to do something beautiful that really want to bring people together and make improvements get really put off by the the politics with with the the bigger p sure and it's rare to find somebody like you that has gone into a more traditional type of politics and been able to do something hmm. and and I just know so many people that have tried and been put off hmm. or that have just been put off yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, sure. never tried. and never tried <laughs> yeah so there was a moment um definitely there was a coming together of a group of us who came, who had been variously um disillusioned by or variously knew about what was happening in Froome's politics um and um, were kind of horrified at different levels. Horrified on the one hand, and then also realised both the need and the potential for things to change. So it's like, this is terrible, and actually somebody could do much better, and it's not going to be them. And my, so I had a moment of, I came from the, within the transition town movement, if you like, so I'd been doing environmental things, went to the council to talk about environmental things, and they were, were completely hopeless, really. I mean, they ran the parks and that was it. And I was talking about that with a bunch of other people um, and that led to a conversation in a pub with a group of people who I didn't particularly know. They weren't, uh, we didn't start from a group of friends. We started from a group of people who, who had been, as I say, at various, ah, oh, this is pretty terrible sort of things. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps because we'd met in a pub, there was a let's have some fun and um, stir this up. There wasn't an intention to get elected, hence the accidental bid. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're right. 
So, so we stood in an, in an election without, um, I mean, I've jumped a bit of the story, but, you know, um, we stood not particularly intending to, uh, to get elected mm -hmm. and then did and then found ourselves running through as a bunch of non people without political with a big P experience at all. Mm -hmm. I love how so many things start in the pub. That's actually where this project mm. started. Mm. I was sat in the pub with some friends that all worked in politics in different ways and we were, you know, we were just having drinks and I was like, I just want to do something. It's right. the election year of 2010. And then I was like, will you do it with me? And they mm. all said yes. And they all disappeared in the weeks uh, that uh, followed. <laughs> <laughs> Left you to it. Yeah. Mm. But when you when you had that meeting in the pub, was that something that that you and your wife Annabelle had like put out and invited people to, or was it just that you all were in the pub and, and it happened? Or uh, so that wasn't no, it wasn't coincidental. Well, there was a group of people who met, um, and there, there were a couple of other key individuals in uh, Independence for Room who were there. And actually, Annabelle wasn't wasn't involved in the political side. Um, again. I'm trying to distinguish these the, the two P's, if you like. I mean, so she and I have been involved in um, the voluntary sector and community organisations in Froome for ever since we came here. Um, uh, and then and Annabelle's continued to be involved much more than me, really, over the last 10 years, um, because I've got um, sidelined in one sense into, um, you know, the, the party, uh, non, the non-party politics. Um, but uh, and that was a, a very deliberate choice. Because I felt that I could get um, some things that I wanted to do done. I, I, given if I had money and staff and potential, if you like, which is what the council can give you, um, then some of the things that I wanted to do, we would be able to do um, with those resources. So it was a choice for me about getting involved in, in, the, um, in that side. Mm -hmm. and, and so then how was the experience of taking you know that idea and then actually making that happen and how did you guys do it without getting kind of bogged down and uninspired and disillusioned by, <laughs> by right from the very beginning deciding that if we were going to do this it had to be fun mm -hmm. um or they had to, I mean, fun it, it has been enormous fun i've laughed more this sounds perverse but i've laughed more at times in the last 10 years than i have probably ever um uh, I mean, I've been in situations not necessarily linked to alcohol or, uh, you know, or anything else, just, but just by being in situations which are so extraordinary that they're enormously funny. Anyway, um, that, so there was a decision right at the beginning that there were some, there was some essentials and one of those needed to be, this has got to be worth our time. It's got to be worth it because we're doing stuff and it's got to be worth it because actually we enjoy doing this. Um, so we put that right in uh, and so right at the core and so that meant, for instance, getting rid of a whole load of the rules and the ways of, that, that councils are normally run, which are stultifyingly boring, mm -hmm. because no one would go to most council meetings. Um, and so we needed to make them occasions which were with a bunch of people who you wanted to be with, doing stuff in a way that you wanted that was light and informal and um, enjoyable. And so we did that right from the beginning. Um, mm. By There's a rule book called... Um, Oh, I can't remember what it's called now. Um, anyway, there's a, <laughs> there's, a, there's a bunch of rules which all um, local councils, um, uh, you know, operate to. But actually, there's a tiny bit of them. I don't know what, 10, 15 percent that you have to do. Things like have an audit. I mean, it's public money. Of course, you have to have an audit, you know. So there are some things you have to do. But the vast um, bulk of it, you don't have to do. And mm -hmm. it's all nonsense. It was, it was created in, I don't know, 18 something or other probably not but it's like it's like it's it's for a different era mm -hmm. so we've got rid of all that and can you share so you know, we're here in Freeman in Somerset and people especially in the progressive side of British politics know quite a lot about what you're doing but the audience um, our friends that listen to this show from all over the world mm -hmm. um, 66 different countries you can give us a little kind of microcosm explanation into local British politics kind mm. of as they were and what you've been able to create here in Froome. Sure. So alarmingly, in many of those 66 countries, it'll be the same system because the British rolled it out into India and half of Africa and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. And so what we have here is a, is a, a parish, a, a, town, a town level, 
a town and then a district and then a county and then Westminster. So a number of layers from the bottom up, which, is, which in theory would work well, that you'd have um, people elected who kind of know who people know, who, who understand the, the way that things work in their own community, and then larger or, what are they, more important decisions, I don't know, more strategic decisions are taken higher up. Um, and so I guess that's the way that, that everywhere um, works. But what's happened in Britain over many years is that, um, it's that, that the top end can trump the, all the layers below. So, so each level can overrule the one before. So disempowers the bottom level, if you see what I mean. Mm-hmm. So that, for instance, for us, then the next level up takes planning decisions. Um, so they can decide whether I can build the shed that we're sitting in or not. They can decide whether there's a housing estate dumped on the side of Froome or not. And they are somewhere else, and actually, in this case, are run by a cabinet of a highly politicised cabinet of people, none of whom come from Froome. So there's this. So what the effect of that is that it uh, that people get less and less involved locally, mm-hmm. because why would you bother? Um, you've got less power. You've got no money, and it's a voluntary job. So at this level, there's no. You know, I'm not paid to be a town councillor. Um, so so um, the the effect of that is that over two thirds of councils at this lowest level in Britain don't even have elections. Nobody, it's you know, nobody wants to do it. The, the people are, are are either dragged in, you know and um, seconded into the role, or they just don't have many people who um, turn up to meetings um, or, or, or who run the things. So the bottom level of democracy is not is just not populated, and it's certainly not populated by anyone who's got any ideas or, or you know, is likely to do anything. In general, there are, you know, there's some notable and, and brilliant exceptions to this, but the vast majority of people, councillors at this level, will be older or old, mostly men, uh, mostly people who've done it for years and years and people who don't want to do it. The, the kind of exception to that is, is people who, are politi- who come from a political party, who stand at the lowest level, but also at the next level and probably at the next level up, because where they really want to be is Westminster and become MPs, because that's the real power, then you can run the country. Mm-hmm. And or so but, it seems. Or so it seems. <laughs> yeah, but it's, so, so it's kind of like. But it's so what? It, I mean, they so they they come with political ideology and they make decisions at this level based on political ideology. So that the Conservatives, for instance, um, at the Froome level, uh, we came in the time of the beginning of austerity. So a lot of a, a reduction in in government in money coming down. So their whole stance was: this is a time we mustn't spend and we mustn't borrow. Because that's what we're told. So even if you were explaining something that was going to be clearly a benefit to Froome, and it clearly made sense if it involved borrowing money, even at a very low interest rate, whatever, they didn't want to do it. So the system is basically, um, in my view, is, 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 is pretty much completely dysfunctional uh, now. Um, it simply doesn't work because you, it's, not, it's, a, it's a chicken and egg thing where it's not attracting people who are um, going to put the time and effort in um, in a positive way, haven't got the ideas. And we really, really need lots of novel, interesting, different ideas to get us out of a, a situation where there isn't money at this local level anymore. There aren't resources. Mm-hmm. So, so we don't get support for mental health, for uh, sports, for arts, for any of that that we used to. So if we want those things to happen, we have to make them happen locally. And so if you've just got a bunch of old people who basically do um, lots of kind of things that mayors and councils do of greeting people when they come to Froome and having meals and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, it simply doesn't work. So we had to up the game. And for us, it was important, us in Froome, it was important to remove the political parties to be able to do that. That's not always the case. There are two issues here. The one is, you know, getting rid of the political parties if they're in the way because of that ideology and, and also, even more importantly, the whole ethos of confrontation. Mm-hmm. That politics is all about opposing what the other person does. So, I mean, one lot's in power, the other lot are the official opposition. Their job is to oppose, however good the idea is, which is mad. And when you, when you watch, you watch a Westminster mm. debate, you watch like PMQs and, and just, I mean, it's what we're used to, so it sort of seems okay. 
But if you just sort of imagine that you're like an alien from like another planet and you're coming down and you're watching Prime Minister's questions yeah. and you're told that these are the people running mm. Britain who mm. has had all this influence in the world and everyone's kind of heckling and yeah, yeah, yeah. and you just be like, what? <laughs> like, this yeah. is... And that has been replicated, hasn't it? So if you went to India, the parliament is run in much the same way. It's uh, No, it's extraordinary. And I'm, I'm tragically the same in Froome. Mm-hmm. So when we first got in, we had seven uh, party people still. With, there were ten independents for Froome and seven party people. And they would oppose us. They would oppose us on principle. So I, so famously, in one case, I don't understand this, so I'll vote against. It's kind of like, um, it's just that whole mindset is about opposition. But what our theory, if you like, is that, that actually we agree on nearly everything. I mean, we may not agree on how to do it, but actually... Um, the things that are going to be best for ordinary people in Froome are going to be pretty obvious, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, so exactly how we do it uh, needs discussing, but that involves discussion, which will involve differences of opinion and, you know, and argument and so on. But then at the end, what's, what's crucial is at the end of that discussion, you make a decision and then you kind of move on. You don't hold grudges, because that's the other thing that party politics seems to do. Um, that we were really determined to get rid of, so that you could you could disagree with each other quite vigorously. You could have a vote, you could lose that vote, and then you you know you go off. I was going to say to the pub again, but I mean you could go off. To, <laughs> you could go home again. You could go wherever you're going again. But you don't hold that grudge. You kind of go, okay, fair enough. You know, I can I can see why that decision was made. I'm not going to um, hold it, and and then uh, use that against the person next time. Mm-hmm. So what I think we've managed to do here is to create a way in which 17 people, because the second election, 17 independents were from, were elected. So we got rid of party politics altogether. Um, to find a way in which we can work together as a group of people for the common good of, uh, of Froome, um, which has served Froome well. Mm. And then because of that, I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole lot of initiatives in Froome that... Um, people look to as you know I'm sure Froome isn't a utopia once you live here (laughs) but but it seems from the outside and from people that I know that live here that there are a lot of things that are that are working and um and some really nice examples like the Froome Compassionate Project Mm. for isolation and loneliness these kinds of things um is, are these the kind of things that have been made possible because of the way that you've been working? And, and do you see a, a very clear impact in, in the community here and in people's lives? Uh, yes. Yes is the one word answer. There's, there's definitely a link. But there was an ecology into which all this sat. I mean, uh, by which I mean that when we came along, there was already, so uh, eight years ago, um, there was already, there were, there were already things happening in Froome uh, in, in many ways. And, and I think that Froome is particularly interesting because actually it neither was nor is a utopia, or is nor was. <laughs> um, uh, it, it, the, the, there's actually there's some of the poorest um, communities in the country here. Um, and there's a, there are, you know, it's a very mixed society. And I think that that's actually really helpful. So, so it's not um, simply one um, group of people in that, you know. And that's I think really important and is part of what makes Froome Froome. And I better not name other, or you know, there are other towns around where I think that's less true, where, they, where, they, where they're not, uh, they haven't got that mix. Like so we were really lucky. in the local area. Yeah, um, and other places that have tried to do something um, similar. But by having that, there's an earthiness about Froome still, and it was very much the deserted place geographically. Um, it's in the corner of the district, in the corner of the county, um, uh, and it's, it, 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 has, it has more listed buildings, which are buildings of sort of architectural importance, than anywhere else in the county. But until about 10 years ago, the vast majority of these were deserted, or, you know, were in terrible condition. Mm-hmm. It, it had always been left on its own. Froome was the place to come for a, Saturday, a fight on a Saturday night, mm-hmm. um, until sort of 20 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, uh, you know, a market town, which like many market towns, the market itself, so the agricultural market had moved out, and with that, quite a lot of the wealth. And then it, it, all of the big industries had left. So the printing, the uh, original, um, uh, well, the metal works and all the original work around weaving, all of that's gone. So very high unemployment, 
you know, why would you go to Froome? Nobody did. You went around the bypass. Um, but then what that meant was that uh, property prices are cheaper. Mm-hmm. So you started to get people moving in um, a bit uh, from um, who, who might work in Bath or Bristol, but then also people who, wanted to, who, who came here to work and live because they could afford to live here. And then that changed the dynamic a bit, mm. um, I think. So, so it's, you know, it's, it's not, <laughs> it's definitely not utopian. Um, but, and, and the council came out, came out of that, really, rather than the other way around. It was, you know, so, so there, was, there was stuff going on. And it's always had, a, a, I think, a feeling of um, people doing it for themselves. So there's been a very strong voluntary sector. A lot of people running, you'd hardly even call them organisations, but things happening by which a group of people might go on a Sunday afternoon and take tea to the elderly or bring together a group of, of older people to have tea. Just that sort of little community things happening all over the place. Um, and the thing which we did when we came in as a council was we multiplied the amount of money going to the voluntary sector by 10. Kind of thing. So there were community grants. We multiplied that by 10. We, and now it's 40% of our money. Of the, the council gets money as tax, uh, takes money as tax from the people and then redistributes it. And, and 40% of that goes back out to community groups. So we very consciously built that community sector on the grounds that the council can't do everything. In fact, it can't do anything much um, and doesn't know anything. I mean, the 17 of us as councillors have shown that we know how to get elected, but we haven't shown anything else. Mm-hmm. And I think one of, the, one of the, you know, what this is about is it's about um, trying to create participative democracy, not representative. It's not saying... Elect 17 people and then they now know everything and will make all the decisions for you. It's saying, elect 17 people and then their job is to create or to help to, to build a society or a, a community where, where whatever it is you want to do, you can get done or have a good try at it. And there will be money and support. And, and the instinctive answer should be yes. So when somebody comes in and says, I want to run a, you know, a karate club, can you help me? The instinctive answer should be yes, rather than going no. And I think most councils or most local authorities answer, for good reasons, is usually no. There's no money. Um, it's not our remit. It's you know, there's plenty of reasons to say no. Mm-hmm. But what we've tried to create is something where where people go yes, and then they might think, um, I've no idea how we'll do this. But you know, to ha- to have resources and, and and ways into other funds and other fundraising and linkages and so on that, that mean that you're building something that's joined up and creating an openness so yeah people can participate either by standing for council or by bringing their ideas and actually getting that their, that energy turned yeah. into something real Absolutely. which then creates more of that enthusiasm and yep. energy and ideas and, mm-hmm. and things mm. So as I say, I think Froome's, you know, that's, that's existed for a long time. And what we as a council have done is to make it, much e- make it easier for people. Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes we're catalyzing stuff. So the ideas have come from council staff or, or, or councillors um, or a need we've identified or, or brought together. So I chaired a meeting about five years ago where we knew or we'd been told that there were people sleeping on the streets in Froome. Went, really? You know, a bit like you're saying, you know, in this nice beautiful little bit of, of Somerset are they really yeah. and so we brought together the churches and or somebody from the churches and somebody from uh, the YMCA and various people to a meeting and said you know so what's going on and they said yeah there's four or five people who sleep every night on the streets of Froome and there's this and there's that and, there's, and you go whoa I had no idea about this I remember it being a sort of real sort of jaw-dropping moment mm. and then from that uh, we um, I mean I guess we sort of um, invited them or that group to form a, a, a group of people to particularly look at this, which wasn't councillors. There were a couple of us who sat on that group, I think. Um, yeah, in fact, I know. Um, and, but, but, but not in a powerful, as members of the community, rather than having any power, see what I mean? And then that led pretty quickly to something called Fair Froome, uh, which is an organisation, which is a separate charity, which the council does give some money to, but they raise, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, ten times as much as our grant now from the community. Mm-hmm. Because interestingly, they've said they don't want to go out to the lottery or to other national funders. They want the money to come from Froome. So it's kind of like 
we're recognising our need. So they run the food bank um, and the uh, furniture uh, and, and uh, the collection of old furniture and redistribution food because people often get houses or get accommodation unfurnished and so then what? Um, and yeah, the food bank and then they have a link to the the, um, uh, the community fridge which is another thing. So um, that, and that's one of many examples where the council's had a sort of integral role mm -hmm. uh, but it's the other model would have been for the council to employ a um, a poverty, I don't know, you wouldn't call them a poverty officer, would you? But, you know, you would employ someone who would who would cover that area of work. And then people in need would come and knock on the door and beg, I mean, in a way. But actually, the, the Fair Froom is very much run. Their trustees um, include many people who've, uh, who've used um, food banks. They have, you know, they're really part of the community. And it's, it's about trying to create a situation in which we recognise we have a problem and we're doing, dealing with it. It mean, rather than this elected body that you throw things at. It's beautiful. So, yeah, really just bringing it back into the community and everyone actually has a sense of ownership and mm. it takes it away from... Mm. Yeah, because often this idea that you have to beg and ask and often those things aren't run very well. And it seems, and you know, who knows why, but the the, the people that organize seem a bit incompetent, a bit like they don't necessarily have the expertise and they definitely don't have, and maybe none of us do, maybe this whole thing about anyone ever having expertise is also mm -hmm. a bit of a, a false, a falsity that we have in society. Um, but if we have openness and the ability to say yes and try and figure out how to do it mm. together mm. and with real desire to mm. make something as good as, as, and as beautiful as possible no mm. matter what it is then then that's when we really can do things that are mm. exciting and 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 create something that's different you're, and you're absolutely right I, I think we we usually don't know uh, I mean and actually many of these situations now have got so complex that we can't know there is no answer mm. there isn't either there either there really is no answer or it's so complicated that we can't get there um, I went to the climate talks in Copenhagen, um, whenever they were, a, a long time ago, 15 years or so. And I, and I remember talking to someone who'd just come out of negotia negotiations around um, sort of compensating people for their, for their uh, or paying people for the, the, the wood, the forest that they kept. And she said, there's, there's probably half a dozen people in the world who understand the complexity of this. And, and, you know, four of us are in the room, one of us isn't. And it's like, and none of the ministers do it. And it's like, whoa, it's, it's just so complicated. And so what we're trying to do on a completely different and, and, and smaller level, something like we've got a real issue around parking. I mean, there, is not, there are not enough places for people to park all the cars they want to in Freem. Old medieval town, lots more housing, doesn't work. So what, what starts to happen, of course, is that people start complaining to the various councils about how they can't park in front of their house and so on and so on. So what we've done is gone, OK, so let's have a public meeting. Let's, let's look at this together. Um, so bring in the various people who could make decisions, but not to be shouted at, uh, you know, uh, to make that decision, but kind of go, you know, so, so what are the answers to... to you know, partly because sometimes you then you get something really left field that'll come in uh, that you think, blimey, I never thought of that. You know, mm -hmm. that, that there may be somebody out there who kind of goes, yeah, well, I actually run a, you know, a, um, a tricycle making, electric trike making company. And maybe we should be beginning to look at, uh, you know, people using more of these and having our own public trunk. Anyway, could whatever it might be. <laughs> no, it could happen. And there is cycle, Cycles Maximus in Froome, which does exactly that. Yeah. You know, so... Um, so uh, these things have to be owned by us as a society, I think, um, not, not by politicians who, who, uh, for whom this is increasingly unworkable. And when you go up to the sort of Westminster level, they can't. It's no wonder the Brexit talks are floundering. It's mind-blowingly complicated and it's insane to put together a group of whatever it is, 15, probably 14 men and Mrs May, you know, in one room and expect them to come up with anything. It's, 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 never, it's not going to work. Because mm. <laughs> it needs to be a, owned in a, like, by... two-hour window. And... Yeah. It can't, yeah. can it? No. And they won't have any silence at the beginning of their meeting. They'll crash straight into, <laughs> uh, you know, into insulting each other. Or, or you know, it, it can't work. Um, and I think that's true even at our level. 
And there are more and more things which are complex and then often they also have uh, conflict mixed in, which is a kind of lethal combination, I think, or can be. You know, once you start, once things start getting a heated layer on top of it as well, it becomes really difficult and, and requires a whole set of skills um, to work with both. Because there are plenty of people who deal with conflict, if it's kind of just simple conflict, if you like, simple conflict. Um, and plenty of people who deal with compli- complicated things. But once they get wickedly complex, it's really, really difficult. So I think that that means a different set of skills for council staff and for councillors um, as well. So, so my role as facilitating meetings is facilitating meetings. It's not chairing them. So we run our meetings much more like uh, well, they're, they're kind of open space. I mean, they're, they're so when the public come, the councillors and the public are sat in one room, and you wouldn't know who a councillor was by their dress or by anything else until until we do get to vote, and then you have to hold something up because sometimes you have to make decisions. Um, and that's been enormously refreshing because a it means lots more people come and contribute, and they actually know what the issue is, and we don't, you know. Um, but it's also about trying to trying to recreate a well to create a situation in which everyone is taking responsibility rather than this because it's unworkable. Mm-hmm. I mean, I feel I feel genuinely sorry for our MP, you know, who who I know gets two thousand emails a week or something. What's he meant to do? How is he possibly meant to deal with these and to to um to uh, respond to them? And to also stay kind of knowledgeable about every issue that he's voting on in Parliament. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you can't. Yeah. So he cheats. I mean, and because he wrote to Annabelle at one point about fracking and said, um, with, with a very knowledgeable letter, and then I saw him a while later, I said, blimey, David, I didn't know you knew so much about fracking. He said, I don't. We have a, we have a database of answers. I just top and tail it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, how, but on the other hand, how could he possibly do anything, do, I mean, yeah. do anything else? He will know about some things, but you can't know about all these issues. But what's so wrong is that he pretends to. Mm-hmm. Isn't it? And so, so everyone goes, oh, so he knows all about fracking. And it's a, it's a, it's a disaster because then when Annabelle meets him and said, oh, I'm surprised you knew about this. What do you, you know, so tell me about that. And he's kind of going, oh, I only know the beginning. It's a bit like, <laughs> you know. That's really interesting. When I worked in Westminster, I worked for an MP. We didn't have that database. Yeah. But I, it was interesting for me because I was working for John Battle, who was a Leeds MP. Mm. And he was very, had a very small team. And later on, he became a minister. So I don't know, things might have changed, but... Um, when, when I was working for him, he had a very small team and he was very, very involved in every decision. And even when I did some, re- you know, we'd talk about it a lot. And I was very struck by that because before that, I had just been interning in DC working for a congressman mm. where there was a huge team and the congressman was very much a ribbon cutter. Right. And, you know, we would have meetings and everyone would just tell him what to say. Mm. And, mm. um, and sometimes I would give him talking notes and he would just take them. And I'm like, mm. I'm just an intern <laughs> and I'm from England. But great, he's taking notes and he's going to say you what I've You could have slipped in all sorts of things. Richard. Could have done. Yes. Um, but, it, but that's the reality of, of, mm. of it. That, and how can we, how can, yeah, it's not a realistic... And I have to be careful because in, in, in slagging off the system and uh, you know, people within it, it's awfully easy to generalise, isn't it? And mm-hmm. it sounds like the guy who you worked for uh, in, in Britain, you know, did an extraordinary job and, and managing to retain yeah. all that uh, and put, putting that amount of energy and, um, and time and effort in. Is, I mean, brilliant, but they're few and far between. Yeah, well, and also because all these politicians also have families and yeah. all the other things yeah, that human exactly. beings have yeah. pulling on our time yeah and kind of should have in a way they? otherwise you become even more in a in a little bubble and even at this level we are in bubbles mm-hmm. i mean you know you're going back to what you were saying asking about Froome and, and our politics if you were to vox pop the good people of Froome, you would still be i don't know how many but a good number who wouldn't know we've even got a town council wouldn't mm-hmm. uh, would have no idea how the system works or be interested because there's a you know a, a deep cynicism I think and um, rejection of the whole system that would put all politicians and all councillors in one uh, you, you know in one boat really um, for good reason because actually democracy doesn't work at all mm. I'm amused that it's um, it's democracy week that starts on Monday Is and it? I'm thinking hmm 
isn't that an oxymoron? I mean, you know, it doesn't. It went, oh, great! <laughs> Didn't even what, know we had well, a democracy. We do. We... And we're funded by the government, and they, I, thought, I, I, I saw there. I thought we lived in a democracy. <laughs> Why would we oh, need well, a week? Yeah, yeah, good point. <laughs> Very good point. Yes, and the other fifty, fifty-one weeks, they tell the truth. No, no, there's lots of. I saw their thing this morning. It's lots of fun. It does talk about fun and games. Fun and games and things. I think it's mostly, or not, a part of it, will be taking school children around the Houses of Parliament and and explaining how it all works. But it's a joke, and actually, it's worse than a joke, I think, because it makes people think that there is a democracy. Mm. And why not spend the money on one or two things that actually, actually engage with people properly, which is what we're trying to do here, and to and essentially to um, to create some more political literacy. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so people are engaged. I mean, they, as I said, they're, they're engaged anyway in the, the voluntary organisations that they run. And then we've been doing things like um, well, what we now call people's budgets. It's, it, it's called participatory budgeting properly, which is really difficult to say. And so PB and somebody said, does PP stand for people's budget? And, mm, good idea. It does now. <laughs> so, so, so a portion of our budget is, is voted on by the people mm-hmm. and in our case, that includes children from the age of 10, because we found we could. Because there's a number of things that sort of slip under the radar at this level. And is that voted for by the people that turn up to the meeting? So we have the, the decisions about um, all of the public events. So um, anything that's going to happen that the council's going to fund, from fireworks to um, the fun day in the park, to all of that kind of thing, there's a budget. People pitch for that effectively, and then a hundred or so people turn up. We've only done this twice, I have to say, um, and um, and vote on those. Um, so we've done that kind of thing, and then we've done single decisions, uh, which thousands of people have voted on. Um, so so what should we do about this particular problem? There's a budget of this. You know, here are some options, um, and then we've done some bigger one-off um, public events too. Or you know, should we spend the money on this, that, or the other? Um, so there's a, a community orchard which we're planning at the moment, which which won the most recent of those um, things. I mean, they're not vast sums of money, ten grand for the for the orchard, but the idea is that you're. I mean, for me, the process is more important than the product uh, in some ways. Well, yeah, as important as the product. It's it's um it's about help or encouraging people to to realise that they can make decisions. They can engage with something. Go, oh, I could do this, or I could do that vote for something and something happens and happens quite quickly mm-hmm. so they you know their involvement leads to something and they can go oh I voted for that um, and then they, so then again you get a sense of ownership that's the idea and of course it's their money our money because that's the other odd thing when people come to a council meeting and say oh, I'd, I'd really like to thank you for the grant that you gave me you know that the council gave me and you're kind of like yeah but actually all we've done is redistributed money that came from all of us mm. Now you're you're doing you with the book and you're doing more kind of talks and workshops and meeting other people and and sort of sharing the ideas of flat pack democracy with others. How do you see that taking off in in different parts of the country or maybe the world? Hmm. The revolution. <laughs> the revolution. <laughs> um, well, it's been very interesting. So, so I was persuaded. I was asked to write the book because a, a publisher who lives in Bath just up the road from us, um, who's written and published books on ecology before, um, had sort of seen the story and thought, this is, you know, this is interesting, it should be written up. And uh, I thought, this won't take me long. And six months later, or whatever it was, I'm thinking, ah, why did I ever say I'd do this? But anyway. Um, <laughs> it's gruelling. It's but... very gruelling. And because I, partly because I wanted something which was really simple and accessible. So things mm-hmm. like, how does the British political system work? It took me... I don't know, a week or something, because I, w- I wanted three pages of this is it. But other things kept jumping in, like, what's a municipal council? I have no idea. What is a municipal you know? Because so, <laughs> some people, there are exceptions to all over the place. And then Northern Ireland and Scotland and Wales have, all have different systems. Anyway, um, to, I, to both the publisher and my considerable surprise, that sold a lot of copies. So I don't know how many it is now, four or five thousand. Um, and and. Because it's, there is a moment, clearly, where um, all over, certainly Europe, um, there are people who are massively um, disillusioned with this lowest level of, of local government. Because 
it doesn't matter whether it's Belgium or France or, or whatever it is, um, or Britain, there tends to be a disempowered um, group of old men who make a few decisions not very well. You know, it's the same, it's the same basic model wherever you go. And politics has often uh, infiltrated, I mean, party politics, because there is this kind of theory that, you know, if you get your grassroots, if you build your membership, then they'll vote at the next level and the next level and the next level, and then hooray, you win. Um, which I think is completely false. I think that most people recognise that, that, that you don't need that ideology or it's, it's unhelpful to have it out there overtly, um, you know, leading where your decisions are coming from at this local level. So there's a general, or oh, there is often a feeling that that, that needs to go. So um, through, I have an ongoing conversations with a lot of people. It seems to be what I do these days. Um, <laughs> um, and I run a, 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 um, a closed group of about 80, 90 um, people who are standing in, in different towns and, and, and so on as a place to share ideas, which was really so as I didn't have to answer all these things. No, well, it was, again, recognising that there's a wider wisdom out there because lots of other people are doing things in other ways. And, and so people can ask, you know, this looks, this is happening in our town. Has anybody else had this happen? And then you suddenly get a load, load of answers. So that's been really useful. So before so, you had lots of people coming to you yes, with their questions. Yes, and they still do. So, so and that's, I haven't really got that right in the sense that this, it's, not re- it's not yet a proper network. It's, it's too pyramidical, really. It's still got mm-hmm. to me too much at the top through the book, I suppose. Um, so there's about, uh, I know of about 70 or 80 towns in Britain who are engaged in some way or other in, in trying to get this lowest level of government to work better. Um, and then there's about a dozen where, you know, a group of independents run the place. And some of those are doing a great job and some of them are not. Um, because the two, as I said earlier on, are not necessarily connected. I mean, you can have a bunch of independents who actually haven't got a way of working together well. And, you know, there's all sorts of people. Oh, you know, they're, a, they're a real problem. <laughs> Egos yeah. and power, you know, that's the thing which I hadn't really um, understood. And there's been a couple of, of what appear to be great revolutions at first. And you think, wow, all this bunch of independents get in. And then so does ego. Mm-hmm. And somebody becomes the mayor and takes over. And it's like, and the whole thing splinters and collapses. Anyway, so, but there are a whole range of people doing this in different ways. And of course, they've only absolutely, as I would want, they've taken some ideas from what we've done in Froome and then used them in their own way. It was never meant to be a, a, um, a one, two, three, you know, do this and you will, all will be utopia. Um, uh, so that's uh, kind of happened here and then there's a couple of flat pack parties in in Belgium and then this link to Denmark which is really interesting where there's a national party that also works on core values so effectively is saying this is how we will operate um, and we will participate with the people rather than saying this is what we'll do because I think that model of this is what we'll do is really um, doesn't work. Well also because you can say this is what we're going to do but you know, we all know whether it's through politics or just anything that we say in our lives we're going to do doesn't quite work that way <laughs> like, because Absolutely. we can't control everything. Mm. And so even if you go into something with the very best of intentions and the highest integrity, you still probably aren't going to be able to necessarily do exactly what you said you're going to yeah. do. Particularly if you don't really have the information the first time when you're looking to be elected you won't have access to all the information. You won't know how the systems work. You won't know the budget. I always think of the, the first new Labour lot who came in you know, with great promises of, of uh, not going to fund so much within the arms industry and uh, you know, to cut yeah. down all that. And I just imagine them kind of looking at the books and going, whoa, that much money, that many people are employed. I had no <laughs> idea. You know, so it's kind of yeah. like, well, what do you want to do? lead to the unemployment of a million people or um, carry on creating landmines. And you kind of go, hmm, OK, that's a bit more difficult than I thought. And yeah. that's, I mean, that's a slightly crass example, but it's kind yeah. of like, it's the same sort of thing, isn't it? So, so you can't make those promises. When you make that example, I, I kind of, when you start, when you start, oh, that new labour and then suddenly things can only get better starts playing in my head because it's the theme <laughs> tune. And then you just kind of imagine this moment where it's like, you know, they turn the music down and they're like, oh, hang on a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Mm. These are really, really difficult issues often, aren't they? 
and, yeah. uh, and, and, and people simplify them in order to get elected. We will, I don't know, give more money to the NHS or whatever it is. And then when you look at it, you kind of go, actually, you know what, this isn't just to do with money or whatever it might be. And realise that it's a much more intractable problem uh, or, you know, and it needs much more work. So um, I, I think um, it's, having said that, at the level which we're working, we won't kill anyone. I mean, we're not making decisions at a town level. We don't run the health or the roads or the, you know, it's not those things that we're doing. It's things that are to, to do much more with, with joined upness, with, with well-being. And that example you, you touched on of the compassionate Froome um, is really, really um, impactful. So that's um, a bit of work which we as a council fund, which I'm always really pleased with because I like the idea that the parish council funds the NHS. But anyway, so we, in a tiny way, we support this work. But what that is essentially is it's, is it's um, a group of, it's within the NHS, the National Health Service, and it allows doctors to prescribe um, going to and engaging with some of the voluntary sector that I've, I've talked about. So you go in with your uh, mental health problem and they can give you, you know, on the screen will be a set of drugs, but there'll also be um, an organisation called Active and In Touch. Um, but the key bit is it doesn't just say go to Active and In Touch because you kind of know that, but, you know, you're feeling depressed. You're not going to go to anywhere. So it, there's then a group of staff, four or five staff, and then 600 volunteers um, who can be part of helping you, literally perhaps holding your hand to take you there and sort of going, um, you know, literally taking you in through the door, sitting mm. down, having a cup of tea with you and, and getting you into that thing, whatever it may be. And Which then, is what we need know, when we're yeah. feeling depressed and isolated. Absolutely. yeah. So, I mean, the obese person is not going to go to the gym. They know they should, but... But maybe they will if, if, you know, if they're introduced more slowly and if you go with them and so on. And those 600 volunteers, I think it might even be more now, are, um, are people like hairdressers and, uh, you know, the barman and people. So they're, they're the linkage into this whole system. So when you go into the, your corner shop, you know, looking unhappy, having always been chirpy, they'll kind of say, what's up? And, um, and then, you know my wife's died, well, did you know there's a, um, a widower's group? I don't, know, I, I don't know the details, but I know how to find them. So they're not, they're not all trained in having all the information, but where that happens. So it's about, in a way, it's, it's only recreating a community as it perhaps would have been and should be. Um, but what's excited the um, National Health Service particularly is that while in the whole of Somerset, hospital readmissions have gone up by about 30%, in Froome, they've gone down by nearly 20%. So, so this is about people who've, old, mostly I suppose older, but not necessarily, gone to hospital. Very often they're released very quickly because they need the beds too quickly probably, back into a community and nobody's checked that they're, you know, they're going to get fed. And blah, blah, blah. So then they're, they're straight round and back into hospital at huge cost. Well, the cost, which you can add up, is sort of three million quid over the last few years. So that's why... People suddenly gone. Whoa! What are they doing in Froome that's that's saving very, very significant amounts of money? Um, for me, it's not. It shouldn't really be about the money. I mean, of course it is, and of course one recognises that that's why people get excited. But it's more about how much better for that person to come out of hospital and then feel that the neighbour who they didn't really even feel they knew four or five doors down has come and just checked that they're all right, and or even knows who they are, mm. and and that kind of thing. Because it's that, I think, that we've, uh, we've lost a bit. And Froome's an, a perfect size for that at the moment. It's 27,000 in people. And you can, well, it's sort of half an hour walk from one side to the other or 10 minutes on a bike. So physically, it's small enough to, I was going to say know everyone, which is nonsense, but I mean, yeah, to, to, to feel you're part of a community still, um, while being big enough to have two theatres and a significant amount of, of council tax. And, you know, so... Enough money that we can do stuff, or mm. enough, it's, it's not just money I'm, I'm always bringing it back to, but enough, enough people really, I suppose, to, to take up ideas and make them happen and so on. Um, uh, but small enough that you can kind of feel you know people. But that can be replicated too, I mean, is often replicated in cities, isn't it? It's not, you know, it doesn't, that, um, having said it's a perfect size, I'm not saying it's the only size. Yeah, I, I mean, I live in London in Hackney and Hackney has its own thing mm. going mm. on that, that makes it 
its own community. Mm. And I think cities are, they can be small, com smaller communities with, I mean, they originally were like small little sure. towns with it that became a city. But I think you have to, maybe you have to make more effort, although I, d I don't know if that's even true. I grew up in a market town that was in the edge of the Peak District in mm. Derbyshire, where the daytimes were full of people from the, the neighbouring villages coming mm. for cups of tea and hikers passing through for a nice cup of tea and, you know, a piece of a gingerbread cookie. But then at night, really rough and yeah. lots of fights and and quite dark. And, and also, I think, part of the, the British sense of keeping up appearances as well. So actually, you know, the people that would come in for tea and, you know, often it would be, oh, yes, everything's fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. You know, mm. like that kind of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and what I love about the Compassionate Project is it's actually allowing space for the, the everyone's not fine bit, yeah. which is actually just the reality of human life. Mm. And none of us are immune to it. Mm. And, and because of things that are the way that the world's changing and because technology and all of these different things, it's, it just, it's just getting harder and harder to, to, to feel that sense of community. Sure. Supermarkets, what are, all of these things make it mm. harder to, to interact and have those inter interactions. And so I love, I, love, I love the Compassion Project because it's like even if you're, whatever side you're on, I mean, just going and volunteering will prevent you from having the mental health issues and becoming feeling isolated mm. down the line it kind of so it has a prevention built in as well absolutely mm. but you you touched on there something which i think is really important and i mentioned earlier too this thing of, of from having that mixture and actually we have a really significant youth well, i suppose it's youth but a, a, i mean a, a drug problem and we have a significant vandalism problem you know and, and, and so on and actually often rural towns are completely unresourced I mean, there's a kind of assumption that those things are in cities and, you know, there was a time recently, it's changed actually in, in, a, in a good way, but until recently there were two police, there were only two policemen in Froome or two, two police people. Mm. And so, no, there were three, but if one's off for any reason and you arrest someone, you have to take them um, an hour away now to where the nearest cells are. So there are no policemen in Froome. And, um, you know, our resources have been cut so significantly. Mm. There are no youth workers to go and hang out in the park with the youth and kind of and just check out what's going on because we're near enough to some big cities that actually we're uh, you know if you want to sell if you want to sell your drugs coming to places like Froome which is only half an hour to drive is a really good place to come because partly people don't you know may know less well what the price should be maybe easy more gullible to things which are not as good quality as they should be all of that kind of stuff so there's some real there are big problems in places I guess and having that Hopefully, having a, that engagement and a, and it's needing that reality, recognizing that as well that it's not all flapjacks and and coffee shops, um, you know. So, and there's a risk with how Froome is portrayed. I think we we constantly winning things was another one in a Sunday paper this weekend of you know the best place to live or whatever, mm. which actually from if you live here are annoying because they don't go into any of the detail. They don't look at the history. They simply, you know, visit a few nice new coffee shops and. Have a fair trade cup of tea. And have a fair trade cup of tea. Yeah. And, uh, which, all of which you can do, but it's actually, that's not really what it's about. It's trying to create something which, which meets the needs of the, the whole population. Uh, you know, yes, the people who want the, uh, that, but also people who, who, for whom it's all a bit alien, actually. And there is a, that going on at the moment, a, a bit. Mm. Uh, definitely, there are people who kind of look at us as a council and kind of go, I don't know what all this is about. People who come to our meetings and kind of go, I don't I don't, really don't feel comfortable here, mm. actually, um, which we've started trying to do, uh, you know, if you're chairing a meeting, taking people through that, because it, it's easy to get complacent, because I feel comfortable in a room full of people all chatting to each other. For other people who are used to the row of men in suits who make the decisions, it's like, whoa, when do I talk? Am I allowed to talk now? Mm. You know, why is he jumping around the agenda? You know, why is he not wearing a tie? Ah, you know. And also for, for you to not think, well, we've already transformed it from that to that, we're done. And to sort of know that it's a constant process to find yeah, yeah. The, the, the best way. Or, you mm. know, we don't know what the best is, but to just keep, keep making it more and more open. It definitely needs to constantly uh, evolve. 
Which is why, incidentally, I won't stand in the next election, because last time we had 35 people who wanted to stand for the 17 seats. So there's no, you know, the people talk about, and I talked about democracy, you know, failing and people not wanting to engage. We've had, you know, more and more people want to stand in that last election. There were 40 people who, 40 political candidates who stood against if, you know, so having said that two thirds of places don't have elections, we had every seat contested by everybody and more. Mm. And, you know, there is a, a, um, a kind of buzz about that, which you can um, create. Therefore, I think it's really important to, to get out of it. And also it's get out of being a councillor, but I see all the rest as being politics. So, I mean, I want to re-engage with the environmental stuff that I came from um, a bit more because I haven't had as much time for that as I want to. And it would be wrong not to put the words climate change into any conversation, mm -hmm. in my view. <laughs> <laughs> Simply because, you know, that's, that's hanging over us. It's happening. It's, yeah, it's happening. And when you walk, I mean, my garden looks very beautiful, but when you walk back down my garden, um, you know, in a moment or two, where are all the butterflies? You know, there's lots of things in there that mm -hmm. should be being eaten by, uh, you know, by insects. And um, I have actually got a bumblebee nest, which I've just found under the eaves of my house, which is great. But, you know, it's like there's some real, really massive global crises going on, which I think may sweep a lot of this sort of thing to one side. But that's where, if well, this is perhaps where I'm being slightly utopian or slightly I only care about Froome. If this is a more joined up com uh, conversation, if this is a more joined up community where people know each other, you know, if it actually keeps not raining, it hasn't rained for a month, what happens if it doesn't rain for another four, five, six months, you know? In a town where people are talking to each other and know each other and maybe we'll be, we'll be more able to uh, relate and support each other in that, in whatever that means, which will be mental as much as it'll be, you know, where do I get a bath? But it'll also yeah. be, is this the end of the world? And you know. why am I in such a good mood? It's very strange. <laughs> used to being rained on in Britain. Uh, I know, I know. <laughs> well, that's one of the weird things, isn't it? That, that this is really lovely. Yeah. But actually, it's not very clever in other ways. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it, it, it actually should have rained a bit. I mean, this is fine so far. It's just if it can, kind of fine, but actually it's not fine in that, uh, well, as I say, you, I'll be really surprised if you see a cabbage white, these white butterflies as you walk down my garden, they should be all over the garden mm -hmm. at this time of year. And they're a sort of very prevalent uh, insect. You know, there's, uh, that's one of the things which, that's why I'm talking about it in a sense, that really worries me. Where's that bottom layer of our um, biodiversity gone? Because everything else comes off the top, doesn't it? So I haven't got as many robins or birds because there's not enough insects for them to eat. And then it's kind of like, well, does that matter? Well, yeah, it does matter because when you come and sit in my garden, there aren't birds singing and we notice those things, don't we, I think. And so you want to integrate this more into what's happening through the council? Yeah, which in, in some ways might be uh, completely left field and things which might not happen. So we're in the middle of trying to get rights for the river Froome, mm -hmm. which is about trying to give rights to the river so that uh, if something happens with the river, you or I or the council or anybody else could then act on its behalf. Um, but it's, and it's also about trying to replace Froome into the Selwood Forest. This was an area of forest. The whole of this bit of Britain was forested. And there's a project around planting trees. And there's a guy in Froome who's collecting acorns from some of the last few trees, which are hundreds and hundreds of years old. So he's got hundreds of oak trees now from replanted off oak trees. And then we're looking to find places and to replant them and to take every opportunity. So again, this is a council funded, supported thing in some ways, but it's also this guy and others What's are looking his to do name, that. This guy, uh, Bugsy. <laughs> that doesn't help you, does it? <laughs> that's, his, that's his nickname, Julian Height. He's written oh. some really, really lovely books on trees, which are actually photos. Well, for one of them, at least, is photos of these ancient trees from all over the world. Uh, the, the ones which are really, I know, iconic. And uh, because there's Longleat Forest just near us, and there's some a couple of uh, oak trees in there which are hundreds of years old. Um, so, as I say, he's collected um, acorns from them and planted them. So, you know, it's things like that and, and making sure that schools and, uh, you know, and the community more widely are engaged or re-engaged. Things like the community orchard, 
It's mm -hmm. a fairly extensive area of land that people will be able to just come and use and pick the fruit in. But we'll also have wildflower gardens and so on. Because we need to be doing those things. But again, so we've banned Roundup in Froom, the um, particularly noxious chemical that's used as a herbicide. But we don't look after the pavements. We haven't got that power. So the next layer up can come through and spray everything as it has done. Mm. Um, because that next layer up happens to be run by the councillors in that next layer up. Are, many of them are, are large scale commercial farmers for whom these chemicals are something they use every day. And so they, you know, they're kind of going, I can't ban that because, it, you know, what would I get rid of the weeds in my field? I, this is how I do my agriculture. So, um, you know, it, th this is where we, we do have um, a real problem. And, and move, any, well, so far, um, attempts to move flat pack ideas up the scale haven't worked. Mm. And I think it's really difficult for them to do so. That was actually my next question was right. going to be like kind of acknowledging <laughs> mm. that that your work is here, but how can these ideas move up? Mm. I don't know, because it's very difficult to sell something which is essentially um, trust me in a process. I mean, I'm selling you a process, the process of which is um, this is how I'm going to work with my fellow councillors and and this is how I'm going to work with you. Mm. I can't tell you what I'm going to do. That's very different from a manifesto approach, from an approach of here are the things I'm going to do if you elect me. Trust me to, to do these things. We know that doesn't work, but that's, that's what we know and we feel safe with it. And I think, I don't know if it's just the British, but we don't like change. Mm. So the idea of changing something is all a bit scary. Um, and attempts to, to um, you know, do the same thing higher up haven't worked because people ask you, what, you know, how are you going to spend the education budget? And if you kind of go, I don't know, I'll tell you later, they go, I'm not sure I trust you. Because I, <laughs> yeah. you know, I want this, I want this. I want, you know, I want to vote for the person who's going to do what I, what I think is right. And um, also, where would the funding come from if you want to stand at an independent level to be an MP at hmm. Westminster? Or you see, you know, the Greens and how yeah. limited what they can, how they can get in is despite the, the membership that they've managed to yeah, grow yeah. and the support. No, I, I, I mean, certainly at the top level, you can't do it, I don't think. I mean, it's, yeah, the Greens and UKIP for that matter, who had millions of votes in the mm. last, not the last election so much as the one before, um, you know, and had no representation. Mm -hmm. it's, why we, it's absolutely why we don't live in a democracy. I mean, it doesn't represent people um, in, in the way that it should. Whereas the Danish system does, for instance. So, you know, so the alternative party that started there, they got, I can't remember what, 4% of the vote, so they get 12 MPs, just like that. Um, and, and if you got 2% of the vote, you'd be represented, even if you were an extremist Muslim party or a fascist whatever party, because their stance is that you're better off having those people sat with you so that you can discuss you know, what it is they want. Mm -hmm. And that, personally, I think that's right. I mean, interestingly, the BNP, the British National Party, imploded after it got people elected. I mean, you know, <laughs> once they started getting people elected and had to actually say what they believed in publicly to a larger group of people, and everyone went, really? You know, I'm not. You know. Yeah. And then it, it all kind of disappeared in, in a puff of smoke, in, yeah. you know, in a way. And actually do things. And if you're, if you're using conflict as your way to rally yeah. support, then what happens when you're then actually in a position where you, yeah. your job is to care? <laughs> rather yes, exactly. Than... Although Trump sort of slightly counter... Oh, I don't know, I suppose it would depends on what happens in the next election, doesn't it? Because his stance is also to create conflict. And so I don't know where that goes. I mean, maybe it goes into lots of conflict, but one hopes not. But, you know, it's... It, yeah, so I, I mean, I, um, I think our electoral system is just a massive, massive problem. And it's a joke now that you have a... a you know, that the Conservatives are in power propped up by an extremist group of... Uh, people from Northern Ireland. And the rest yeah. of the world looks at that. You know, your, your listeners in the 66 uh, other countries look at that and go, hang on a minute, I thought this was the mother of all democracies. Yeah, well, and not to mention that our Prime Minister sort of just sweeped in in amongst a bit of a crisis. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Elected by nobody except a bunch of her mates. Yeah. No, I know, it's, it's um, a complete joke. So at what point do we take to the streets? Why aren't we more Spanish and Italian and 
you know, or, or whatever. When, when, when do all the people hang out of their windows and start banging saucepans and going, this is not democracy? When do we boycott it? Yeah, I mean, it was interesting because after Brexit, I mean, having, I, I got my, um, my heart a bit broken working on the AV campaign for the mm. alternative vote in 2011. And then I was like, no, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to have to find other ways to, to you know, mm. um, to be an activist and, and just to live in, mm. in the world and try and make things better. And then after Brexit, I was like, I came back. And then I just tried to find a place to put that energy mm. and I couldn't really find anywhere. And, uh, you know, I knew so many people that were like, yes. And mm. then, so I went to all of the people working on different things. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm here, sleeves mm. are rolled up. Like, mm. what do I do? And mm. I know I've got an, a whole load of people that want to join in too. And there just wasn't really anything. And so then it's just gone back to sort of just, you know, grumbling on Facebook about things. I think this is what you need to do. You have to do what we've done here. Yeah. I mean, it's not, I mean, I don't know whether you do personally. I think what, <laughs> what you are doing is, re- is, you know, absolutely fascinating and going around and collecting stories, if that's what you want to call them. I mean, uh, because that is how we can kind of pick up ideas and, and go, oh, you know, maybe there's something in that or maybe that would work for me or, yeah. you know, wh- whatever they might be. Um, so good for you for taking the time. And like all, I mean, it's the same as me saying all my council stuff has been voluntary, which it has. And so as it, as is yours. And it's something, it's somehow wrong that we should have to depend on that, isn't it? Or that it, 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 we as a council ran something called Breaking the Mould the other day, which a hundred other councils came to, mm. to share ideas on how to get councils to, to work better. There are national associations of local councils. There are government funded bodies whose job it is to, to make the system work better. I don't know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. You know, they wouldn't even give us the addresses of other councils to invite. I mean, it's kind of like, it's, 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 it's bonkers. That, but in a way, that's what we have to do, I think. We have to grab it. There's a Scottish organisation called Our Democracy, whose strapline is um, Act As If We Own The Place, mm-hmm. which I increasingly like. <laughs> it's like, that's what we have to do. And I'm finding... A, 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 a certain release which I need to develop more at 60 and you know so my children have left and you know so it doesn't actually matter if I'm arrested now I mean it doesn't you know that I can I can be doing I can start saying things more which I haven't done much in the last hour really but in the sense of I could be much more <laughs> radical I could be much more um, pushing out ideas and, and doing things because they do need saying and doing I think and we okay. do need to I'll, I'll give you a, a year and I'll come back for the for the radical hour <laughs> In your I, sta- shed. <laughs> I started in the yeah great I look forward to it I started the year like that there was a there's some there were some trees in town with some uh, cast iron around them which was break cutting into the bottom of the trees and I tried all the official routes to get this taken away um, into it and on the first of January I went and smashed them up with a sledgehammer mm-hmm. because I, it wasn't going to happen or I got well, fed up of waiting um, and of course you know nobody says anything and it's it's fine and the trees can carry on and grow and. I mean, it's. Uh, I'm, sla- I'm. We're now halfway through the year, and I haven't really smashed up anything else with a sledgehammer. But I, n- I need to. <laughs> um, I have one more question because mm-hmm. I know that your grandson is awaits awaits uh, it's playtime, which is also an important part of, Absolutely. of life. Um, which is, you know, you were mayor of Froome, and of course, part of being mayor is the gold chains and. Mm. And as I meet you, it appears that you aren't regal, pompous or hip hop mm. enough to really enjoy wearing the chains. <laughs> and, and so you did something fascinating with it, which kind of came to be. Can you share a bit about, about what happened with the chains? I can. So there is an official gold chain. And one of my first things I, I you know, was on my list of things to do was to go to a school who had a green group, an environmental group. And I wore the chain, or I took the chain to chat to them, and we got talking about the ethics of the gold and how, um, you know, the, the slaves, whatever, the underpaid workers in South Africa or wherever who'd, who'd mind it. And they said, we'll make you another chain. So they made me another chain out of bottle tops and, and bits of old tyres and so on. And I wore that for their, um, the fate, uh, their, their school fate, the, their chain for the school fate, and opened it. And then that was photographed in the paper, and then that led to a, can we make you a chain as well? And then that led to basically every event I did, I, uh, people had the 
opportunity to make me a chain, which led to all sorts of wonderful chains made of vegetables and um, a barbed wire amnesty one, which I was particularly fond of, which was just a coil of barbed wire with a candle in, which was very hot when lit, I have to say. Um, <laughs> but, and then it turned Took out... Took you that, closer to the, yeah, the issues and the danger. Absolutely. Then there's a, um, a portrait photographer in Froome who said he'd love to take pictures of the chains and somebody else who made um, 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 frames, who'd just come to Froome, he said, I'll frame them. And so they exist as a, there is a, a, an exhibition of 25 very large pictures of these chains. Um, which we sorted into the different community organisations because they all kind of touch on different issues around food, around poverty, around health, you know. So and they just are this about exhibition. where things come from in general. The fact yes. that the thing that we take for, in this case, would take for granted that these are the gold chains, but just having that conversation about the fact that they are unethical gold. Yeah. It was, a, it was a great, I mean, it, it was a complete accident as the whole of my political experience has been. Um, but uh, it, was, it was really nice to do. And there was nobody who ever minded. I wore the proper one, I have to say, when there were proper events. I wasn't a complete idiot um, <laughs> in that sense. When also Why there is, is something... That? Why would you say... Could, could you not have turned up to the, the proper events? No, the... no, no. So let's say... No, because partly... I mean, there, is a, uh, there are some people in Froome who I absolutely respect. So, for instance, the Remembrance Service, which is around um, you know, people who died, showing respect for the people who died in them. Uh, in, in the in the wars, it, w- it would be com- insane of me to uh, to turn up to that in anything but, and partly because I'm mm. representing Froome, I'm not representing me and my slightly wacky ideas. And to not make a scene and take the attention away from Ex- what precisely from a remembrance. Yeah, 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 is. yeah. So, so to, it would be completely inappropriate. So, um, so it, I mean, but what it was really was saying, I'm happy to advertise your event or use my body. To, to promote your event uh, or you, and your organisation in whatever it is that we're doing, um, doing together. And that exhibition is still there if anyone wants to borrow it. It was actually, where it, most recently, it was in Devonport um, Guildhall, the Devonport, which is down near Plymouth, the old mayoral building or the old um, town council buildings have, been, have become an art gallery. And, um, the, and so they had it in what would have been the place where all the mayors met and, and all the council met. And there were some, old, there were some photos there of you know, whatever, 18th century mayors with their chains, which was just lovely to have this complete contrast. And the mayor of Plymouth came and, uh, was in her big chain, I have to say. <laughs> but, um, I think that those sorts of things, I mean, they're just sort of saying we not, need to get rid of all this formality and stuffiness and recognise mm. that being a councillor is a role that someone can play for a sh- short or long, but I mean, essentially for a short time to volunteer to do for the benefit of their community. But it's only one role. There's something weird about um, ego in this, as I said before, and power, particularly with the mayoral thing, where there's a sort of bowing down to the mayor. You're the chair of a committee. You mm-hmm. know, you wouldn't do the same thing to the chair of the school governors. So why is it any different doing it to the mayor? Uh, anyway, it's an, it's an odd situation. But I was um, pleased to have done that. I, I really enjoyed being mayor. I didn't, I didn't want to do it because, uh, well... I don't know, there's all sorts of reasons I don't like putting myself forward f- for things. But actually, I was persuaded to, and I met all sorts of people I would never have met in Froome, um, and really enjoyed that other look at uh, the way that, that you know, this community that I came to, or we came to, um, 35 years ago, didn't really mean to stay. I don't know, fate takes over. We didn't mean not to stay, but life goes by, and here I am. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Well, I, I, love, I love the chain story because, you know, big part of my work has been using what you wear as a way to mm. start conversations and also to to live your values in the world um because there's there's a lot of unjoined upness of like i care about this oh no but this is from primark and da, da, da. i know and, and so yeah it's a it's a beautiful story i want to find find a way to exhibit them somewhere well do i'd, lo- I'd love future. you to find a way to exhibit <laughs> them because they're they're sat with the photographer who owns them and um i know he'd love to get them out there um yeah he's a uh, yeah He's, he's someone who's, who's taken portraits of MPs, incidentally, and, and in the House of Lords he was commissioned to take um, photos of, of, of that end of politics. Mm-hmm. Where I'd really like to get them is the public gallery in the House of Commons. Mm. But they're considered too political, which is another of those weird things. <laughs> apparently. We tried, but they, um, they don't want to have them. That's really interesting. <laughs> if, if the House of Commons isn't a place for that. Where is? Where is? Amazing. Thank you so much, Peter. It's um, a pleasure. Next time we're going to go 
deeper into the radicalness and also I want to I'd love to talk more about the ego and what happens to your ego mm. when you get more involved in in politics and you get titles and and whatnot uh, but we'll save that for okay. a year from now a year from now <laughs> excellent good and you the website is is it flatpack democracy yeah flatback democracy dot com uh, yep which I, I don't use very much. Every now and then I stick a blog of thoughts onto that, really. But it's where one can buy the book most easily. And uh, you can buy it from someone who pays his taxes rather than someone who doesn't. Thinking Excellent. of joined up thinking. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you for listening. As always, you can find links to everything we mention in this episode, download our book and discover so much more over on the blog. We don't believe in selling you things you don't need through this podcast, and so it's made possible by you, our community. If you loved this and would like to contribute to our Patreon campaign or join our online group to connect with other listeners, please visit www.thefutureisbeautiful.co and click on community. Please also hit subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes so we can grow. Here is to us, creating a beautiful future together.